It was a desolate, dismal scenery. Up or down the valley, as far as the eye could reach, the same unvarying mass of black rock. Great must have been the relief of the volcano that poured such a mass of black vomit. These were the words of Julius Caesar Merrill in the mid-1800s as he traversed across this very spot, the Jeffrey Goodale Cutoff, an alternative route on the Oregon Trail. Thousands of people, their wagons, belongings, children and livestock traversed across this terrain. First promoted by a ferry operating businessman named John Jeffrey, a trapper named Tim Goodale would later guide many along this route as a good way to avoid issues encountered on the original routes. But the challenges here were still many. As anyone who visits the region today can imagine, dry hot summers, wind and dust, rattlesnakes, and rough terrain. One of the most menacing parts of the journey was a huge expanse of otherworldly, dark, jaggedy land that they had to painstakingly find a way through. But what exactly was Julius referring to when he talked dismally of this unending, unforgiving landscape of black rock? Julius and the many pioneers who crossed along the Goodale Cutoff were encountering a black rock called basalt. Basalt is a volcanic rock that's iron rich. If you take a look at a map or an aerial view of southern Idaho, we can see just how large this swath of black rock stretches. This landscape is now mostly encompassed in the Craters of the Moon National Monument, a testament to the out of this world landscape that the pioneers encountered. They must have been truly baffled by the scenery, still astonishing to gaze over today. In his journals, Julius correctly noted that the rock originated volcanically. But if that's true, where is the massive volcano of which he spoke? No such volcano seems to be visible here today. Perhaps it eroded away. The volcanic material or lava responsible for this landscape was extruded some 15,000 to 2,000 years ago. So it's unlikely that it would be eroded and undetectable today. So where is it? Hey, just a real quick message from me, Heather, the host here at Let's Go Geo. Actually, I am host, videographer, photographer, editor, creator, all that stuff. This channel is run solely by me, and I started it because I do love geology and all things related to the topic, and I love teaching, and I thought it would be a great way to bring to people that in the field experience, but digitally. So. Let's Go Geo was born. The project's going well, but I have a lot of great other ideas. So if you want to help me out, support me, and help the project move along, you can find me on Patreon, and you can become a fan there as well as get access to exclusive content. So head over to Patreon. Otherwise, let's get back to today's topic. Turns out there's not just one volcano responsible for all of this material. It actually sources from a series of cracks or fissures in the earth, what some people might think of as the gates to hell. This material is similar to the massive basaltic fissure eruptions from the Miocene millions of years ago that blanketed eastern Washington in a sheet of black rock known as the Columbia River flood basalts. This type of lava erupts by shooting out a stream of red-hot melted rock or lava. The material can shoot hundreds of feet into the air. Today, Icelandic and Hawaiian basaltic eruptions frequently give us a modern view of these events. In fact, the names of the types of lava originate from those Hawaiian-like lavas. Pohoihoi is a ropey, smooth texture. It flowed with low viscosity, a bit like water, but liquid rock. Yeah, melted rock. So as you can guess, very hot material. These flows result in a thin, smooth, pattern, like wavy, cooled strips of lava. Ah, uh ah, -uh, lava flows, on the other hand, leave behind a rough surface composed of broken lava blocks called clinkers. Now, the surface is very spiny and hard to walk across, and it's easy to remember the name of this lava because if you would just imagine the sound you would make if you had to walk across them barefoot. And this material is divided into three main lava flows, the main craters of the moon, the Wapi, and the King's Bull regions. These once explosive lava flows have since cooled to form this jaggedy landscape and clogged the vents to form cinder cones. 25 cinder cones now dot the landscape, including the one you see behind me there, Big Cinder Butte, and Silent Cone, 
which 6,500 years ago wasn't so silent when it was shooting out cinders and spewing lava across the landscape. I mentioned this material came from many fissures like open wounds in Earth's crust. But what causes these gaping cracks in the Earth's surface to open up? Basaltic lavas erupt from zones of rifting, where Earth's crust is basically pulling apart. We can see the processes of rifting today at the East African Rift, responsible for the formation of the Red Sea. It's caused by the African and Arabian plates pooling apart. Continental rifting can turn to oceanic spreading, creating seaways or even full oceans. This was the birth of the Atlantic Ocean. We can see rifting continuing today along the Mid-Atlantic Rift in Iceland, where the Eurasian and North American plates are pooling apart at what's known as a spreading center, or the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. So is rifting what's responsible for the craters of the moon? Well, we do know of an ancient rifting system in America that almost led to the tearing in half of the U.S. Buried basalts and paleomagnetic data have confirmed the Keweenawan Rift, or Mid-Continental Rift, zone. If it had continued, we might find ourselves having to navigate through the Sea of Iowa today, but it stopped a long time ago. And since this was billions of years ago, and it's located in the Midwest, not Idaho, it can't be responsible for the craters of the moon. But clearly the modern western U.S. is very volcanically and seismically active. And today active rifting does occur in the western United States and can be seen right here in Craters of the Moon. The fissures are related to weak spots near the surface. And here in Craters of the Moon, many different fissures have been responsible for the lava that's spewed out in fountains and covered the land for thousands of years, today covering over 600 square miles here. You heard me right. The U.S. West is rifting apart. We can see the topographical impact of extensional forces with a quick glance at a map. Notice the patterns of lines on the map, representing mountains and basins. Very obvious across Nevada, but also easily seen in Utah and in southern Idaho. What's going on? The land as it stretches causes a reduction of pressure on the rocks beneath. These pressure reductions cause rock to melt. Melted rock, or magma, can then move up through any open pathways in the Earth's crust, like the weak and faulted zones along the Great Rift. This extension has been ongoing for about 30 million years and continues today. But unlike the hidden Keweenawan Rift, we can see signs of the modern Great Rift quite obviously around craters of the moon today, such as around the King's Bowl area. Features like this, along with cones, hot springs, and layers of lava, indicate the zone is still very active and will likely erupt again soon. But when? Now, researchers have examined and dated the eruptive events of the Great Rift Zone. In craters in the moon, eruptions of lava have occurred in eight main events. Eruptions occur approximately every two to 3,000 years. The earliest eruptions took place about 15,000 years ago, and the last phase of eruptions in the smaller, Wapi and King's Bowl lava fields were dated at, that's right, around 2100 years ago. Now, this doesn't mean we can expect an eruptive phase tomorrow, per se, but it also doesn't rule it out, and it's likely that it will occur within the next thousand years. The region is clearly still active. In 1983, the Lost River Range of Idaho experienced a large 6.9 magnitude earthquake. This quake led to the tallest peak in Idaho, Mount Bora, to grow by a whole foot. And the valley below, the Lost River Valley, dropped by a total of eight feet. So where might these eruptions occur? Well, researchers have determined that eruptions tend to take place along the rift where it has been quietest the longest. And this puts it around Big Cinder Butte to Sheep Trail Butte, or even to the northern part near Lava Creek. But regardless of when and where it does take place, it will certainly leave behind more of those interesting geologic features that we can still see here today like the blue lava flows of the blue dragon pahoehoe flows. The color comes from titanium magnetite crystals that reflect blue light. Tree molds now exist where past lava flows have incinerated trees and left us with voids. But living vegetation also gives us information about past lava flows, like their dates. Triple twist tree was dated at 1,350 years old, meaning that that lava flow must be at least that old.
There are other ways to date the lava flows, too. Geologists can radiocarbon date charred vegetation, or they can use paleomagnetic measurements by looking at the orientation of magnetic crystals which align themselves with Earth's magnetic field during deposition. Caves are a common feature in areas with lots of limestone, but caves are also common here in these lava fields. The caves or tubes form because the material in contact with the air cools faster than the material below, which continues to flow out, leaving a void in the form of a lava tube or lava cave. You can explore lava tubes and caves right here in Craters of the Moon, but you can also find these in other lava fields across the U.S. West. There you have it, the Craters of the Moon, named because it so resembled the craters on the moon, but now we know it's actually sourced right here from Earth, and it's likely to do it again. If you're not already subscribed, join me here at Let's Go Geo on field adventures in geology, geography, volcanoes, and more. I'll see you guys there.